Mark P. Otten back with you. Okay, this is your introduction to structural equation modeling by way of first an introduction to path analysis. So um, I'm going to analyze this path here. It uh, seems to have two curves in it. Uh, it seems to have a like a little bit of a line coming off the top there. Maybe it's like for cars because it's got that dotted line in the middle. Uh, the, either side of the path is very green, so it's probably not California unless it's like in a the springtime. Probably uh, this path, my guess would be this path is coming out of somewhere like Hawaii. Um, but I don't see any cars on it, so we can't see whether the cars are driving on the right or the left side of the road. Okay, anyway, uh, that's not actually what path analysis is. Path analysis is, well, I mean, kind of is. Uh, path analysis is actually a statistical technique uh, that involves multiple multiple regressions as part of the same statistical model. So um, SEM, structural equation modeling, will come next because um, once you turn one of those uh, variables in your path analysis into at least one into a factor that is factor analyzed or um, analyzed by way of confirmatory factor analysis, then uh, as soon as you turn one of those variables into a factor, you have structural equation modeling. But uh, if we're not doing any factor analysis and we're just treating each variable as itself, as in multiple regression, and just um, creating, let's say, an additional pathway or two, um, the easiest way to go from uh, multiple regression to path analysis is to make your dependent variable into an independent variable as well. And so then that DV can also predict other things. And so it serves as an IV and a DV. That's, a, that's the path analysis uh, typical example. So um, let's start with one uh, that you might be familiar with here. This is mediation. So um, this is in real life uh, someone or something that comes in between two conflicting parties, a mediator. Uh, but in uh, regression, we have um, a third variable that intervenes to represent or explain at least part of the relationship between IV and DV. Um, so uh, what I did uh, for my master's degree was I ran a statistical model to test whether enjoyment was a mediator of academic success. Um, it was basically a, uh, uh, the spinoff of this example here. Enjoyment of stats mediates the relationship between which textbook you use and success in stats class. I didn't actually analyze statistics classes for my uh, master's degree project. What I did was I looked at like uh, uh, an existing data set of children uh, and their enjoyment of history. Um, and uh, so there were some statistics that I published there. That was before my switch to the sports psychology field. Okay, so here's your mediation. Uh, model that we're going to uh, work with today. The multiple regression that we start with is just success being predicted by both enjoyment uh, of statistics and your textbook choice. But as soon as you add in that um, that uh, pathway from textbook choice to enjoyment, uh, then we have a mediation model because um, the uh, pathway from textbook uh, choice to academic success is now at least partly explained by enjoyment because we have a complete triangle there uh, of pathways. And also we moved from a multiple regression to a path analysis because that um, uh, enjoyment variable there is serving as both an IV and a DV, right? It's, it's an IV in predicting success, but it's also a DV in uh, being predicted by uh, textbook choice. So your rules for mediation. Uh, there's a couple different uh, schools of thought on mediation. Um, the uh, start of it is that if um, you are to have a relationship that is to be mediated, that initial relationship should be significant in the first place. So that's that beta one there, uh, textbook choice relating to academic success. So if there's nothing there, if textbook choice is unrelated to success, then well, there's no relationship to mediate uh, or be explained. Um, uh, if you add in that uh, enjoyment variable, as we have here, um, then you have partial mediation if you, if that beta 1 remains significant. So suppose it starts significant, textbook choice relates to success, and then you add in enjoyment, there's some relationship, let's say, in beta 3, that enjoyment does matter, um, or beta, both beta 2 and beta 3 are significant. That means that enjoyment does matter, and it's also predicting 
uh, success, but then you watch that beta one and, and what happens to it. So if it remains significant, you have partial mediation. Uh, uh, and here's your definition of partial mediation. The mediating variable explains part of the relationship. So for example, if you um, read Tabachnik and Fidel, uh, 2012, using multivariate statistics, you succeed more in stats and it's partly because you enjoy it more. The full mediation model is uh, if um, that um, beta one disappears. So it starts out significant and it disappears, um, meaning that enjoyment has now explained the whole relationship. So uh, the mediating variable in this uh, scenario explains all of the relationship, causing that original beta 1 to go from significant to not significant. Um, and so uh, by this example, if you read Tabachnik and Fidel, you succeed more in stats because you enjoy it more, um, as opposed to just partly because you enjoy it more. Okay, so that's the um, traditional approach to mediation. Uh, I say people sometimes, this is my experience, people sometimes also like to uh, see Sobel's test. This is uh, created by Michael Sobel, who is still teaching at Columbia. Um, and this there's a website for this that I'm going to show you in a second. This test determines if a mediating variable uh, significantly changes the IV-DV um, relationship, the original IV, uh, in, in our example being textbook choice and success being the DV. Um, so there's a, a test of that uh, a test of that change that is usually like if there is a significant change, it usually means that um, the beta one is going to change significantly as well. And so you can kind of use that original rule that we just went over um, too. Uh, and so sometimes people are satisfied with that; they don't need to see Sobel's test. Um, but other times, uh, review and I, I say people. Who are these people? These are reviewers of your conference poster or your, um, or your uh, paper submitted for publication um, or your future PhD advisor. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, it kind of just depends on what people are used to. So I'm going to show you the website here in a minute. This is a, uh, uh, the front page of it. All right, so there's some wisdom on this website uh, from uh, Christopher Preacher from Vanderbilt here um, and uh, Jeffrey Leonard Ellie from the uh, University of Toronto. They say a word to the wise, the Sobel test works well only in large samples. We recommend using this test only if the user has no access to raw data. Um, if you have the raw data, bootstrapping, which we have not covered in this class, um, uh, nor will we, uh, offers a much better alternative that imposes no distributional assumptions and consult Preacher and Hayes. So if you're interested in a, I, I gave you the, okay, so the first criteria was looking at that beta one. Does it change, and if so, how much? Uh, for mediation. The second criteria here is the Sobel test, which runs well in large samples. The third alternative, which we won't cover, um, is the bootstrapping approach that um, you have here a couple of links to on the Sobel test website. So uh, again, sometimes um, people look for, my, so my experience, uh, people rarely ask for the bootstrapping approach. Um, but uh, if you were asked for that, you know where to go. It's this website and these links and you can go look that up. That first article there is only three pages long, so it's very uh, straightforward um, in its, in, if you were to go and read that. So meanwhile, we'll uh, assume that we have a large sample uh, for now, and we will scroll down to the Sobel test, and we're going to run this here in a minute for our sample data. Okay, so back to the model briefly. Uh, let's add in an additional DV here to make this look more like a, a full path model, because, well, full path models I don't know, they can get out of control very quickly. You have to, if, unless you have one of those large samples, you have to be a little bit careful uh, that you don't add in too many variables. But let's add in one more. Uh, so this was from um, some uh, real data that I collected a few years ago. This is, um, uh, I affectionately call it road rage research, trying to identify why people get upset when they drive and what their self-reported behavior is like. Uh, we didn't actually go and... Um, sit at the uh, stoplight on the sidewalk and watch people drive. We just ask them to self-report their behavior. So there's some limit to how much honesty we could count on uh, from them. Um, but uh, given that, we gave them some anxiety scales. Uh, there's a trade anxiety scale that is pretty common in, in anxiety research. There's driving anxiety, which is specifically questions about how you might feel if you are uh, behind the wheel and something happens. Uh, same thing about risk-taking behavior, uh, some scenarios you're supposed to rate how, how many risks you take on a daily basis in driving. 
And then we had this uh, LA versus not LA variable, uh, which is if you are driving in LA County, which presumably is a more stressful place to drive compared to other places in California. So uh, we uh, collected a bunch of data. We had primarily females um, and a lot of college students in the sample, but not completely uh, college students. So we did have some uh, community members that we managed to gather to fill out the survey. So the mean age ended up being 29. And uh, we plugged when we plugged this into SPSS, um, we found that trade, trade anxiety was highly related to driving anxiety. So if you're driving on the road um, and you are feeling anxious as part of your personality, let's say, or you're just prone to anxiety in general, then you are more likely to drive with anxiety. And that was the primary finding here, the 0.66 really stood out. Um, and so when you run this path model, you what I'm doing already is I'm evaluating each individual pathway. So that 0.66 was the powerful one. Uh, the others there were not significant. So what do we do with this model? Well, we could test for mediation. We would need to back up first and look at that um, LA uh, driver driving anxiety relationship uh, first. And it's 0.06, which is not significant here. But the question is, was it significant in the first place? And what does the Sobel test have to say about it? Um, so the hypothesis there being just that if you drive in LA, you experience more anxiety. Um, so we, run, we ran that and we got a dreaded p-value of 0.051. By the way, this uh, research was presented at a couple of conferences but never published. Maybe this was the reason. I don't know. <laughs> uh, we had a 0.13 there um, for our beta. Uh, and so if we consider that significant, then we have full mediation, right? Because we had a relationship, then we ran it. Uh, the beta there became 0.06, non-significant. Uh, but let's run the Sobel test. There, there's some question as to whether this really is significant with a 0.051 uh, uh, p-value. Um, so we'll run the Sobel test on this. Okay, so uh, we're looking at the website again uh, for the Sobel test. Um, the mediation model there is on the right. The, um, the thing to know about this is when you're entering in the numbers uh, down here in the website, um, you got to make sure you enter in the unstandardized um, uh, or raw regression coefficients, as it says there on the website, uh, along with the standard errors. So you just have to go back to your SPSS output. For example, in this case, um, we have trade anxiety uh, on the right there relating to driving anxiety 0.66. That is the standardized uh, beta uh, for that relationship. But we got to go back and get the B, which is the unstandardized version. Uh, that is here, 0.707. Again, you can just find that in the SPSS output. The standard error in the in the output should be right next to it. In this case, 0 0.052. Then you go back this 0 0.10 here for the relationship between uh, LA driver and um, train anxiety is 0 0.10 standardized. Unstandardized, it's 0 0.093 with a standard error of 0 0.062. So you enter in those values. Again, you're testing for mediation here. Um, and you're going to click calculate and it's going to give you three tests actually. The one to pay attention to is the um, Sobel test there. Uh, 1.49 is your test statistic and your p-value going across here is 0.13597. Not significant. So we do not have significant mediation here uh, despite the fact that the uh, original beta 0.13 dropped to 0.06 um, when we added in the additional variable trade anxiety it just wasn't a large enough drop to register as significant mediation. So um, the Sobel test, at least according to the Sobel test. Okay, so moving forward with the path model, uh, there are some other, or path analysis, path model, same thing. Uh, there are some, some other stats we should report, and this will lead us into uh, what those stats are that we need to report for an SEM. Uh, so first of all, people like to see people, again, this is reviewers of your poster or your publication, uh, uh, submission. Uh, those are the people that we're talking about here. Um, uh, they usually like to see error uh, arrows in the diagram too. Um, these are denoted with an epsilon typically. I don't know why. People like Greek letters. Um, the textbooks have the epsilon in there so we'll go with it. Um, it matches the beta uh, uh, in terms of both uh, being Greek uh, so each regression may be written in the form y equals beta times x. That's the regression format uh, standardized plus that epsilon out, out there. That's the leftover or residual variance. 
in y after x has been added to the equation, or it's all the other things out there in the world that could be predicting variance in y besides x. Um, and so that's an important concept. Um, it's there in regression. It's emphasized even more in SEM um, or in path analyses because uh, in, those, in the context of path analysis and SEM, typically we have a lot of variables um, to then account for variance in our various DVs so we also need to, uh, at the same time, acknowledge that there are other factors out there in the world that may be affecting, for example, uh, your risk-taking behavior when you're driving or your driving anxiety in this case. So you see those arrows, they're pointing from empty space into the box, or toward the box that represents the variable there. Um, and that's just typically the way it's done with that little diagonal angle to it, um, again, conventional, but I'm not sure exactly why. Someone had to choose that at some point, um, that format. How do we get the values? Well, we're going to come back to that a little bit later. Um, and so I'm going to move forward for now uh, and talk about covariance. So um, this is your correlation table from SPSS. Uh, typically, when we make these maps of the paths and the regressions, we also just need to conclude with a correlation matrix of all of our variables. So um, that's for a couple reasons. Usually the readers of path analysis papers are not super up on what a mediation model looks like or the Sobel test or um, some of these things we're talking about. Readers oftentimes like that just basic correlation matrix. Um, and it also bridges the gap from when you have multiple predictors uh, leading to a DV you, some of the uniqueness of those predict, I mean, we can start to think about um, running some additional analyses like uh, partial and semi-partial correlations as in regression or the um, dominance analyses, things like that um, to support our regression. But in lieu of that, a, a, again, a correlation matrix is nice because it just gives you a, a sense for what the bivariate relationships are existing in your data set. And here we see with this data that the only significant relationship in fact, is the one between trade anxiety and driving anxiety. Uh, so that tells you something right there. Um, if we wanted to, and we will need to, uh, if we're going to understand SEM in the long run here, uh, we're going to need to convert these correlations to covariances. So uh, that is not uh, part of the standard output or part of your standard understanding of regression, uh, typically, and that, that being covariances or a covariance matrix. But it's a pretty simple conversion. Um, in the end, you take a correlation between two variables, uh, you multiply it by the standard deviation of one variable, and then multiply it by the standard deviation of the other. We're going to map this out on the board in class. Um, and that, what that does is converts your correlation to a covariance. It also makes your uh, correlation sort of unstandardized. It gives, gives the, the relationship between those two variables, it gives it units again. Um, based on what those uh, two variables were like in terms of their variance. So, um, so the covariance is like an unstandardized version of the correlation. And it gives us the foundation for our future studies here of SEM because uh, that covariance matrix is then compared. So suppose we have, in this case, four variables. We have a 4 by 4 co covariance matrix. Um, then we take that matrix and we compare it to uh, the matrix that is implied by our model. So our model in this case had certain relationships that were hypothesized by our model, then those relationships that are hypothesized to be significant are in fact representing strong covariances between those particular variables. In this case, we only had one strong correlation, one strong covariance, and so our model is a little bit different than what we uh, expected because we expected a bunch of significant relationships and we didn't get them, we only got one. And so that comparison is going to underlie um, SEM and it underlies path analysis as well. Um, so how do we get this model covariance matrix? I just told you that if we have, let's say, one, two, three, four, as we did, four relationships hypothesized to be significant in our model, well, we could just put numbers on those. Like we could just say, oh, a significant relationship is a 0.4 or 0.6, whatever it is. That's kind of the, the beginning of, of understanding this. Um, maximum likelihood is something that you may have studied in the past. Uh, that's the most popular one. It's the most scientific one uh, to start with. And we can, again, 
study this more as we go along here. Uh, if you're curious about the math behind this um, estimation of the model covariance matrix, we'll get to it more in this class and in these videos. Um, but meanwhile, you can take a look at the Tabachnik and Fidel book uh, for the five pages there that introduce this maximum likelihood model estimation. Okay, so um, uh, what all this does, uh, all this covariance estimation, all this comparison of the model and the actual data, what this does is it allows you to evaluate the model as a whole, which makes sense once you have a, a bigger model because you're not just relying on individual betas and those relationships to allow you to assess the model. You're looking at it as a whole and you're trying to figure out, um, does my map of hypotheses, does my collection of hypotheses represent my data? Is my data um, consistent with my hypothesis? And so then it's a, it's a new form of hypothesis testing. It's sort of like a, a collection of hypotheses that you then reject or not reject based on model fit statistics, which is exciting to show you. Okay, so there's three things typically you need to report. Uh, again, there's some difference on what people tend to ask for on posters and publication. Um, there, these are the three that I feel like you can't get around. These are the ones that everyone looks for, it seems like. Um, and then there's others that maybe some people look for, but not others. So what are those three? Chi-square test, the CFI, and the RMSEA. Let's go through them one by one. The, CF, uh, the uh, chi-square test of model fit is the first, probably the, the first that was generated uh, in SEM theory. Um, as applied here to path analysis, compares your, as we were just talking about, compare, it's a comparison of your estimated covariance matrix based on your model, so that's like what you hypothesized, to your real life covariance matrix based on your data. So you're comparing your hypothesis, uh, you're saying that these paths we expect to be significant, you're saying that in advance, then you're assigning some numbers to it theoretically that match your hypothesis, and then you're comparing those numbers to your actual data. So uh, this is uh, done with a couple of clicks uh, of the computer program R or uh, EQS or M plus. Any of these programs will get you your chi-square test if you enter in your data correctly and uh, so on. So, um, so we'll, we'll just show you the result here and we'll let, leave you to uh, explore how to, how to get that in R. Um, so uh, the degrees of freedom here are necessary as well. The degrees of freedom, number of, it's number of data points minus number of parameters. So I gotta cover what that is here. Number of data points is P times P plus, what is this? P plus one over two. Okay, P is the number of measured variables. Okay, so I don't know why it's P. It's kind of confusing. Um, but uh, number of measured variables in our model was four, right? Because we had four variables. Um, there was our mediation triangle, and then there was that additional risk-taking behavior dependent variable. So you take that four, you multiply it by five, divide by two, you get 10. That's your number of data points for this model. Uh, the number of parameters is the number of beta values. So that's the number of paths, predicted paths. One, two, three, four. There were four in our model. Uh, plus the number of variances estimated as part of the model where each variance is estimated for each measured variable. So in this case, you could also say number of betas plus number of measured variables, and that would work too. Um, each measured variable gets a variance, and then that variance is entered into the model. So in this case, we had four betas, four pathways there of prediction, and then four measured variables or four variances. So four plus four gives us eight for our number of parameters. And then that degrees of freedom uh, um, formula was a number of data points minus number of parameters. In this case, 10 minus eight gives us two, and we can plug this into R, and we're gonna get our chi-square test of model fit. So again, this is comparing our, um, uh, our model implied covariance matrix to our actual data covariance matrix. If there's a big difference between our model and our uh, data, it's sort of like saying that, there, that our model is bad, right? Because we're saying that our model was way off from what our actual data was. Um, it's sort of like, and so we use a chi-square here um, to uh, make that comparison. Typically when we run a chi-square test in other scenarios, we may or may not want a big difference. Um, in the original chi-square example, let's say if you learned back in intro stat, 
uh, you might be comparing observed values to expected values, and you might be trying to uh, um, ensure that there is a difference. Well, in here, in, with this chi-square, um, your observed values is your data, your expected values is your model, and so you actually want a small difference. You don't want those to be different if your hypothesized model is what you're expecting. Um, so in this case, we have a difference. Uh, 6.93 is your test statistic with two degrees of freedom. That gives you a p-value of 0 0.03. So we have a difference. Our model is significantly different than our, uh, than our data. And so um, we reject our null hypothesis, which implies that our model stinks. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, for models based on large samples, um, we actually almost always reject this test, or this test is almost always rejected. Um, and so what that means is we need other fit statistics to continue um, uh, to evaluate our fit. We can start to look back at our model, and we did, we did have four paths, right, that we predicted to be significant, and only one came out to be so. So that does imply that our model is not that good. So the fact that this was rejected kind of makes sense. Um, let's move on to those other fit statistics, though, to get a better sense of what it really means. Um, here we have the comparative fit index. This is comparing our hypothesized model to one that is really terrible. Uh, <laughs> the one that is really terrible is the one in which all variables are independent of each other and completely unrelated. So what we're doing here is we're trying to determine if our model is better than nothing. If our, if, that, if our relationships between our variables are better than nothing. Um, and here's the formula. Um, the way this plays out is we have our one out in the front, um, and then we're going to subtract something and hope that that something is small. If that something is small, uh, let's say less than 0.05, then our CFI it comes out to be 0.95 or greater, and that means your model is good. In this case, it's saying our model is good. So let's review these numbers real quick. 6.934 minus 2 on the top, and that is your hypothesized model chi-square, which we just got from R, and the 2 was our degrees of freedom for that model. The bottom part of the fraction there uh, is, the, is the same thing, but it's the independence model. That's the one that is like the one where it's really terrible and no variables are related at all. That one, the, um, there is also a chi-square for that one and a degrees of freedom for that one. Those you can just pull from the R output. We can show you how to find that in R. Um, so pulled from the R output, here we have 149.088 minus 6. That's your degrees of freedom. Also pulled from the output. And so we're getting a, a pretty big difference here between our uh, model and uh, the terrible model. Um, and I think this, is, in this case, is driven by that 0.66 relationship between trait anxiety and driving anxiety. If that one hadn't been so high, we probably wouldn't have had such a good difference between our model and the one uh, that is terrible, right? Because if that, what that, what, what I'm, basically what I'm saying there is if that point six, that point six six is really different than zero, right? It's really different than the relationship between trait anxiety and driving anxiety being zero or having those two variables unrelated. So if there's a big difference there, then our model overall um, is, even though in this case the other variables were relatively unrelated, uh, our model overall is showing a pretty big difference between it and a terrible model where all variables are unrelated. So the comparative fit index here is giving us some success. Um, and the chi-square uh, test, whereas the chi-square test did not give us much success, but again, the chi-square test is often rejected, so a comparative fit index that we just the, the comparative fit index that we just got is encouraging and tells us not to just throw away our model. Um, and so that's encouraging. So we move on to the third one here, the, the root mean square error of approximation or RMSEA. Um, this one is similar to the CFI in, in that it's a comparison. This one compares your hypothesized model or our hypothesized model to the perfect one, the one that where all variable, the perfect model is like we hypothesize these relationships and they're all exactly amazing. They're all, all of our relationships are really represented by high numbers and distinguishing themselves from any other relationships we could have hypothesized. So 
Uh, we want the RMSEA to reflect a small difference. We, if our model is good, it is close to the perfect model. Uh, the closer we can get, the better. So we have a formula here. Again, uh, this one you can derive from your chi-square uh, value. So this is a, uh, there's an F, a capital F with a hat on it and a zero in the subscript. That is, the formula for that goes in the top. That is your chi-square uh, value for the model minus the degrees of freedom. That should look familiar. That was on the top of the fraction for the CFI as well. Uh, divided by capital N, which we'll, I'll show you what that is here. Um, and then on the bottom part is just the degrees of freedom for the model again. You take the square root of that, you have your RMSEA. So uh, the capital N is 239. That was our sample size for our, uh, uh, for our data. So 239 was our sample size, 6.934 chi-square minus 2 degrees of freedom uh, on the top. You divide there, then you divide by 2 again, take the square root, you get 0 0.102. This one is borderline model stinks <laughs> because the good range here is uh, less than, well, less than 0.06 means your model is really close to the perfect one. Um, between 0.06 and 0 0.10, people have said, well, your model's not terrible. It's pretty close to the perfect one, but not real close. And then greater than 0 0.10, pretty far from the perfect model. So uh, 0 0.102 is telling us it's pretty far. So, so the conclusion here, by the first test, the chi-square said model stinks, uh, but we do not despair. Oftentimes models stink. Then we go to the second one, the CFI was good. That tells us that it's pretty uh, far from a bad model. Okay, so we're onto something. And then the RMSEA is like, well, but it's also pretty far from the perfect model. So mixed reviews for this model. And I think it's, it really is because we had one really strong path and three weak ones. Um, and so these fit statistics are kind of split on what that means. In real life, what that means is we should probably keep our model, but we should make all of our conclusions be about trade anxiety and its relationship with driving anxiety. Okay, so just a couple notes to finish up. Uh, R will also give you a couple of other things that we'll come, to, uh, come back to later when we get into SEM. Um, it gives us uh, the, the numbers for the standardized and unstandardized uh, equations um, and those error values or those epsilon values that we'll talk more about as we go into SEM. And it will also run some post hoc tests, which we'll also talk more about. Um, you can drop paths, you can add paths, depending on um, uh, what the output tells you. You just have to be careful that you don't stray too far away from your hypothesis, your original hypotheses, um, because, or justification for adding and dropping things. Uh, because you don't want to stray too far away from the scientific method if you are um, a true structural equation modeling researcher. Okay, more to come in future classes and future videos.